when wealth is transferred from one generation to the next, 70% of the time, the next generation loses all the wealth by the end of their lifetime. And if you're among the fortunate few 30%, let's say, that are successful in transitioning the wealth, when the second generation transfers it to the next generation, which is the third generation of the family, they lose another 70%. Welcome to Absolute Trust Talk with your host, Kirsten Howe. Absolute Trust Talk brings you tips, tools, advice, and interviews to help you build a reliable knowledge base on estate planning, business, and finance to start preparing for your future today. Hello, and welcome to Absolute Trust Talk. This is our live version of our podcast here at Absolute Trust Council. I am Kirsten Howe. I'm the host. And today we are going to be talking about wealth transitions. We've all heard uh, the old adage, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. And sadly, for many families, the transfer of wealth from one generation to the next doesn't always go smoothly. This is true for very wealthy families, but and it's also true for not so wealthy families. It applies kind of across the board, and that is sad, and it doesn't have to be that way. In this episode, I'm going to be talking to Richard Del Monte of the Del Monte Group about the underlying reasons why wealth transfers often do go badly and the tools that he uses and recommends for families to use to not be one of those casualties. I'm going to introduce Richard officially in just a minute, but uh, first, if you have a question and you're watching us live on Facebook, go ahead and type it into the comment section and and we'll see it and we will read it at the end. If you are not watching live, you're listening to the recording, I I can't help you, (laughs) but we are always here to answer questions so you can certainly reach out to either Richard or myself afterwards. Okay, enough of that. Now, my guest, Richard Del Monte of the Del Monte Group is a certified financial planner and a certified wealth consultant He is nationally recognized as an expert on families and wealth. Richard, he's got so much exposure in the media. He's been featured on Fox Business News, in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Private Opportunities Club, Private Wealth Magazine, Trusts and Estates, and Family Wealth Report. And I'm sure there are many more that he didn't bother to mention to me. (laughs) He's also an author. His book, Endless Inheritance, Moving from feuding to flourishing in your affluent family. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And he's a much sought after speaker. Uh, he recently gave a TEDx Bellevue talk on a place of possibility for families and wealth. Richard has spent over 35 years counseling individuals, families, and closely held business owners, providing them with innovative and creative ways to keep, grow, and enjoy their wealth. That's a very important (laughs) word, enjoy. He excels in guiding clients through challenging life transitions and and finding ways to make seemingly out of reach financial goals become reality. And that's what a good financial advisor should do. If you wanna get to yes, Richard is your man. Richard has an MBA in financial planning from Golden Gate University here in San Francisco and a BS in business administration from Cal State Chico. He's been a faculty member at the Institute for Preparing Heirs, a student of Bowen Family Systems, and a founding member of the Council for Shared Leadership, LLC, which established standards of excellence for values-based advisors and the families they served. It's a very, very impressive CV. We are so lucky to have a few minutes of Richard's time today because he's in very high demand. Thank you, Richard. I'm so glad that you're here today. Thank you, Kirsten. I really appreciate this opportunity to be with you. Good. Yeah. Well, it'll be fun. I hope. <laughs> so, <laughs> Richard, you've been a financial advisor for many years, and you really have developed a reputation for and a specialty of working with families to ensure that the transfer of wealth from parent to child is successful. And mm-hmm. as we know, those transfers don't always go well. So maybe we could start by just giving us an idea of the magnitude of this problem. How often do these generational wealth transfers fail? Sure. Yeah. That's a great question because it's funny that it's so prevalent, but most people aren't even aware of it. You know, you mentioned the shirt sleeves, the shirt sleeves proverb, and that's something that's not just, you know, an American thing. It's global. In Ireland, it's clogs to clogs in three generations. And in, uh, in Asia, it's rice paddy to rice paddy. For, you know, I'm serious. 
they have it's, their, it's own, a human, their idiot their adage yeah yeah i mean it's a human condition and it speaks to how what happens is when when wealth is transferred from one generation to the next 70 percent of the time the next generation loses all the wealth by the end of their lifetime and if you're right. among the fortunate few 30 percent let's say that are successful in transitioning the wealth, when the second generation transfers it to the next generation, which is the third generation of the family, they lose another 70%. So over three generations, there's a 90% loss rate. Oh my God. I mean, it's just, it's just That's devastating. That's astounding, yeah. It is, it is. Wow, so when we say there's a, you know, a failed transition, so the failure that you're talking about is the wealth just disappears from the family. It's no longer right. in the family. I'm guessing that there are other things that perhaps go along with failed transitions and we could talk about that you know family dynamic personal problems all of that right. so i guess that's my question what do these failures look like yeah that's that's a great question there was a study done kind of a landmark study in this field done by a, some of my mentors actually roy williams and vic pricer and they followed 2150 families that failed to maintain their wealth and their family relationships over 20 years they followed them and well, I asked him, like, what, what is the reason that your family failed? And the answers were really striking and kind of shocking because most people would assume, I think, that if you lost all your money, it's probably because you, there's some kind of a planning error, right? The, the investment advisor put you in a bad investment. Yeah, investment or, you know, no offense, but the estate planning attorney forgot to have the document signed or something like that. And actually, that study showed that only 3% of the failures had anything to do with a planning error. So basically you and the estate planning uh, field are doing a great job. You're not causing any of these things. It's really 60% of the failures were caused by a lack of communication and trust within the family. Now think about that. That's something, you know, in the, in the uh, financial services world, we never even talk about communication and trust within the family. And another 25% of the failures were caused by unprepared heirs so the kids didn't know what to do after mom and dad are gone when they inherited the family's you know real estate portfolio or the family business or whatever it was well so that's 85 percent of the failures yeah uh, which is really quite remarkable when you think about it these yeah. are things that are within at least in theory within the family's control it's not exactly. it's not something that the professional did to them it's not something the irs did to them it's Right. Yeah, these are family issues is really what you're talking about. Communication, mm -hmm. preparation, <laughs> trust. Those are mm -hmm. pa family issues. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's fascinating. And yeah. yet here you are a financial advisor who helps people with those family issues. <laughs> mm -hmm. So let's focus on the first thing. If a family has a communication and trust problem, when do they call you? What's causing them <laughs> to call you? How do you get involved? I would love to say that they call me because they know what these risks are and they want to make sure their families don't fall into that trap, into the shirt sleeves proverb. But right. we all love the proactive client, right? <laughs> right, right? But they are, you know, one in a million, unfortunately. When we typically get called is when the family is in a big blow up. There's a big, big problem. People are fighting. Siblings won't speak to each other. Parents won't speak to certain siblings. There's a big problem that they, that they just don't know how to work out themselves. And that's when they throw the Hail Mary and want to get you know, a professional involved. Okay. And so what do you do in that situation? You got the family is in chaos or disharmony, at least, I guess you could say. What do you do? Well, the first thing we have to do is try to get them calm and try to understand what's going on. But it's really interesting because when the problems present themselves, they always think, well, we're not getting along about this topic, you know, whatever it may be. And they'll look at that particular issue as if that's the issue. But unfortunately, you have, it's almost like an onion. You have to keep peeling back the layers and get to what's really going on. And every single time I've done this, underlying whatever the problem at hand is, that problem at hand is just a symptom of the deep-seated problem, which is something that happened in the family years ago. And sometimes it's like if it's a sibling issue, you know, it could be like you stole my boyfriend when we were in middle school. And I never forgave you. And now I'm going to take it out on you about this particular issue, you know? Yeah. And so you have, so you could solve this particular issue, but you're not getting to the deep seated problem. And you have to go back and say, okay, let's look at this issue. And you know, let's talk about, you know, what's really going on between you two or in this family. Yeah. We yeah. see that a lot, especially after the parents have died. So you and I look at it, I look at it before death as well, but where we mm -hmm. 
those kinds of issues tend to really present themselves for us is after the parents have died. And that's where you get siblings fighting over, you know, a teapot or some yeah. silly thing like that. And it's yep. never about the teapot. Even It's never even about $100,000. Nope. It's about, as you said, some childhood issue that was never addressed adequately. Okay, so you peel back the onion and you see that there's this issue that somehow right. needs to be addressed. What What's the family going to do next? What do, you, what do well, we do? Well, what we do typically is we have kind of a, a two-day retreat that we put the family through. They'll come and spend like Saturday and Sunday with us, and they'll come in. It's, it's a conflict resolution workshop, basically. And so they'll come in and they're just, their arms are crossed and they're very upset. They won't speak to each other. Sometimes you can't even get them there. You have to really, you know, twist arms to get them there. And by the end of the second day, they're leaving and they're crying and hugging and everything else. So it's kind of remarkable. But the, what you have to do is help people understand that we're all human. The, these conflicts are, are part of the human condition. And so we behave a certain way when we're convinced that we're right and other people are wrong. Right. And these are things that we do to each other. You know, they're kind of like behaviors that we inflict on other people. And if you actually look at it, we may not be right. Yeah. It might just be our perspective is different from other people in the family. And the second thing we have to do is teach them how to listen. And I'm sure you've seen this. You know, everybody thinks they're great listeners. Oh, I'm a great listener. The average person could not repeat back a paragraph that somebody else said to them if their life depended on it. It's, it's, we, we are not good listeners. You know? right. And so we listen to refute. We listen to, you know, to argue with people, try to get our word in and say, this is where you're wrong and all that. That's not listening. People don't feel heard if you're doing that. So what's needed is to be able to teach them to listen, to understand the other person's perspective. And when you can do that, like through active listening, you can actually get to some real life-changing understanding and resolution. Well, those are really valuable skills, I guess, to acquire the ability to see that there's more than one perspective in every situation and every, every, every failed relationship, there are two people who have responsibility. Absolutely. Right? And, and to help people come to that awareness, that's huge. Mm -hmm. That's really huge. And then, you know, teaching someone to listen, really, not just wait quietly until it's your turn to talk. Right. That's not <laughs> right. But we're all terrible at that. You're right. We are. We, we are. We yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So obviously, I'm guessing you have various exercises or you lead conversations that, I mean, it's like mediation in a way. Kind of, but it's not, it's more like, I, I'd like to call it coaching. Right? coaching. People say, it's, you're like a psychologist. No, we have psychologists that we bring in for the, you know, yeah. for these family situations. In fact, I do, every meeting I do has a psychologist with me, but my role is more like coaching, you know facilitating that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. Asking the right questions. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That sounds like a lot of fun. I sometimes wish I had gone down a different path of that that appeals <laughs> to me. I, I like that kind of thing. Okay. So the other thing that you mentioned besides communication and trust was the unprepared errors. Talk about some examples of unprepared errors and, and what you've done to change that situation. Okay. Well, typically, we'll have a conversation like this with maybe the parents or the, the siblings, and they'll say, oh, my kids get along great. And they may get along great as siblings. But once mom and dad are out of the picture and suddenly one, you know, they're, they're having to be business partners right. or they have to be one of them is the trustee and the other ones are the beneficiaries. And there's a power disparity. Oh, boy. You know, they have no experience with that. And so all the great things that they might have done you know, as siblings have no bearing on how they're going to, because this is a whole new complicated relationship. And so if you just thrust them into that, it's like you're asking a football team to perform in the Super Bowl with never having practiced. You know, it's, you're asking for trouble. You've got to teach them. You have to give them experiences while mom and dad are around, ideally, that will give them the same kinds of interactions that they're going to have to have once mom and dad are gone. Right. We create opportunities for them to have those interactions on a platform that's not going to kill the family if it doesn't work out. So, okay. So what does that mean? Like maybe you as siblings give them a project? Yeah, exactly. So okay. for example, yeah, for example, so like uh, one thing that's really good, I'm, I'm sure you've been involved in is family meetings, right? And so instead of having the parents run the family meeting, the family can decide, well, we're going to have G2, second generation, be in charge of planning the meeting. And so G2 could be 20 years old. They could be 60 years old. I mean, it depends, you know, who, it doesn't really matter. But they're in charge of deciding where are we going to meet? What's the conversation going to be about? 
What are the logistics? How are we going to get everybody there? What are we going to do about food? Are we going to have any fun, family fun while we're doing this? You know, all that stuff. And who are we going to bring in as an expert to talk? Like, are we going to bring in our CPA, our our, uh, estate planning attorney to the meeting? What does the family need to hear or experience so that we can start growing? And putting that responsibility on G2, that's exactly what you're trying to do is have them step up and take leadership roles in the family. And if they screw up and it doesn't, the meeting doesn't go well, it's not going to kill the family, but they're learning. That's right. one that's one that's example. Just trial number one and right. we try something else. So exactly. What yeah. what else? You I'm sure your toolbox is stuffed full of right. things to try. Every family is different, right? Exactly. You have to meet them where they are and see we will uh, we'll actually give them a, a laundry list of these are these are the kind of things we could do. What strikes you? What's the low lying fruit for you that seems like a good opportunity? But one of the ones that's most common, I'm sure you do these all the time. Do you do family estate meetings very often? Like, I'm sure you do, right? To explain what the, the terms of the trust and what's going to oh, happen. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I think that, you know, I'm sure you could speak to this, but from my experience, just facilitating that, if a family does nothing else, that is powerful because mom and dad will be sitting there in front of the children and explaining what they want to have happen. Everybody hears the same thing. This is who's getting mom's hutch. What is it you said? Mom's brooch or something. Whatever, you know, this is who's getting it. And they all get to hear it. We actually like to video those because no one, so no one can say, well, I didn't hear that. And it really gives everybody the chance to ask the same questions rather than mom and dad doing the shotgun approach and telling different kids different things and then causing an issue. Right, yeah, yeah. that's a good one. That is, yeah. that is a good one. And, uh, information is a very helpful thing. And parents who, you know, for whatever reason, don't share that. You can understand the reasons why they might not wanna share, but sometimes it's a more compelling reason to share. Yeah. yeah, that's my position. Almost always it is more compelling, but they're afraid to open Pandora's box. You know, there's a lot of concerns they have. What if this goes bad? Or what if they start arguing? You know, all that kind of stuff. And those are things that are legitimate, but then they put their kids in harm's way with their shirt sleeves parable. So mm-hmm. a problem. Right. So, you know, name your poison. What do you want to have happen? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the thing about unprepared heirs too, I mean, I think that it's not only they're unprepared to work together and or they're unprepared to deal with, you know, being in business, which a big estate, even if it's not including a business, it is a business. Yeah. That's the funny thing about the trust business is that you're mixing family with business. Right. And that can be disastrous. But Unprepared heirs can also be people who are just really, maybe they've been enabled. Maybe they've had things too easy. They aren't quite fully launched. Right. (laughs) And so all of this stuff, it's almost as though parents who have a lot of wealth in particular, they don't just have the normal parental duties. They have even more. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) An even bigger job. It's complicated Um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Maybe share a couple more of your oh, sure. tools for okay. getting the family up to speed. Yeah. So we often will create what we call a family bank. And this is an account where the mom and dad will write a check to the siblings. Let's say there's five kids and we'll say you know, our, everybody's name is on it. And we they give them a check at a meeting and say, OK, your job is to take this money and invest it and come back next year and tell us how you did to mom and dad. And it's, it's got to be it's, it's some kind of a meaningful amount of money. I've seen families that are, you know, that are relatively not very affluent that made it with three thousand dollars. And it was a big, important thing for these kids. But I've seen other families that have done fifty thousand dollars. Just depends on the family. Yeah. But the kids have to go decide, like, you know, what are we going to do with this money? And the, the kids want to obviously impress the parents and just really hit it out of the park. But the parents just want to see, can these kids work together? at all. And so uh, right. the kids have to go out and they have to decide, well, what kind of entity are we going to put this in? Who's going to be our advisor? Where are we going to custody this money? What's our investment policy going to be? Who's going to watch this? Who's going to report on it? All those things that if you think about it, those are exactly the kinds of things that they have to deal with once they That's actually the inherit the money, right? right? And they've got to cooperate. So if they screw up, who cares? We're just, we're, we'll work on the, on the, you know, fixing that, but you want to get those out of the way now. And it's super powerful and it builds a lot of camaraderie and cooperation between the family members. Yeah. So it's the same kind of idea, give them a project, but now it's a real, like it's an investment project. Right. Right. Just putting together a weekend. Yeah. Exactly. Uh Yeah. I like that. You can also give them one property. Say you have a bunch of rental properties, give the kids one property and say, you're in charge of this one. Now you're the landlord. 
Yeah. yeah, you're the landlord, you deal with all the issues. Let's talk about what are the capital expenses we're gonna do? What about the rents? All those things that you're gonna have to do later, but you can cut your teeth on it now. You know, just anything. You can have the kids be in charge of your donor advised fund. You know, how are we gonna invest this and how are we gonna decide where the money goes? Uh, That's yeah. a great example, you know, yeah. and you teach the children you know, to be philanthropically inclined, you know? So yeah. there's just so many ways that you can approach it depending on the family. Right, yeah. I. Mm-hmm. That's- Fascinating. I had not, mm-hmm. I had not thought of any of those things. Yeah. <laughs> That's really fascinating. I especially like the donor advice fund thing. You know, the kids have to go out and research charities and, you know, all the things that you want to know before you give to a charity. And- for sure. For sure. You can even start young. Like we've seen families where we, we've encouraged them to say, we have a thousand dollars, kids. These are young kids, five, six, seven years old. We have a thousand dollars. The family's going to donate to a charity this year. We want you to go out and do the research and come back, and we're going to have a family council meeting and tell us where you think we should do it. And then whoever, whatever, whatever, however the family decides, like if they want to go to Tony Larusa's R, for example, yeah, you bring yeah, yeah. the kids down. You you set it up in advance and bring the kids down to there and say, here's the check. Show us what you're doing. You know, and and the, and the uh, executive director can bring them around and they can get the experience. Like, wow, this is so right. powerful what we're doing here. This is way right. more fun than getting a Maserati. Maybe not that bad, but you know, that, <laughs> but, you know but they get to see that like, it's, it's really impactful. Yeah. That's and they it. get it at a young age. Yeah. At a young age, that would really have a lot of impact Yeah, um, to actually yeah. see where their money is going and what it, yep. what it gets spent on. It gets spent yep. on dog food, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Thank you for sharing those. Sure. I think we probably should turn to our questions so we we don't take too much of your time. So let me just scroll through. Okay, so the first question was entered a little bit ago. It's probably before we started talking about this. What can you recommend for parents who want to teach young children to be charitable? And maybe we just covered that. There's one more, though, if you want to do that, I can give you. Yeah, let's Um, talk. The grandparent challenge. The grandparents, they kind of put them out to pasture. Go play golf or go drive around in your RV or something. But, you know, bring them into the family and use them as mentors. You know how it is. The kids very listen to their parents, but they'll listen to their grandparents. Yeah. You know, yeah, and yeah. so because the parents are the common enemy of both of them. Right. And so they, you know, and so grandparents can be excellent mentors in a family to help them with that kind of thing. You know, so they're super powerful and you can't forget them. That's such a good point. Yeah, mm-hmm. that because you're retired doesn't mean that you have nothing to contribute. That exactly. Fact, it exactly. often means the opposite. Yeah. All that wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What do wealthy parents need to do to make sure their children grow up with a work ethic? That mm-hmm. might be a little outside of your realm. No. What do you think about that? Well, I think that the real issue is to help them understand what feeling empowered feels like, you know, and feeling fulfilled actually feels like, you know, and so teach them, give them experiences where they can actually feel fulfillment instead of pleasure. And there's a big difference. Like, you know, I said, the Maserati versus, you know, helping do something like the John Muir Health Foundation. I'm on that board and we actually give the families tours of the hospital and we show them all the things that their family has done to help the hospital grow. Your family built this wing or this NICU or something, you know, and it's just, it's powerful. For the kids yeah. to see that because the, the kids otherwise are experiencing that whole thing is these people are taking my inheritance away this, right. this hospital and if they go see it and it's like oh then they start thinking our family is doing this and it's a whole different experience yeah. so i think that's part of the work ethic but you know giving them opportunities to work and feel and esteem is really important too yeah. yeah 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 i think that work ethic thing that's big uh i talked to my clients a lot about that. I think that there definitely is a danger of kids who grow up with a lot of money and things were always available and easy. And knowing that they have a lot of money makes it easy to become a dabbler, you know, to pursue this career for a little while. And then when your boss makes you angry, you quit and then you go pursue, you know, because you don't really have any skin in the game. Right. And so, again, that's another job for the parent is making sure that those kinds of attitudes don't develop. Absolutely. And that's one of the root causes of the shirt sleeves proverb is right. exactly what you're saying. Children doing that and not feeling connected to a purpose in their life. Yeah. yeah I think yep. that's really right that you really hit the nail on the head. They've got to yep. feel connected to that right. and it has to be purposeful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I got one more question. Oh no, I guess I got two. Is there anything you can do if, Oh, if one child just won't participate in the family meetings or retreat, what do you do about that? 
That's a great question, Kirsten. So the thing that we kind of do, it's a little sneaky and underhand that I have to say, but we <laughs> tell them, I hate to give away my techniques, you know, but uh, we tell them, don't worry about it. It's fine. You don't have to attend the meeting. We just want you to know we're going to be talking about your inheritance at that meeting, but don't worry. You don't have to come, you know, and they come, trust me, they'll come. It's a little underhanded, but you know, it, it does get them there. Once they get, once we get them there, they're going to have a great experience. We know that. So right. even if they have beefs and everything, they just, they think that it's going to be what they already have experienced in their family, like miserable and fighting and everything. But when they're actually with a good skilled facilitator or, you know, uh, right. someone that can teach them things, it's a whole yeah. different experience. Yeah. It's yeah. not going to be yeah. the same old Thanksgiving dinner where right. everybody storms off before dessert. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. You're going to make sure that that doesn't happen. Right. Um, okay. I've got another one here. What is the first step in implementing something like this with full grown sibling? The first thing I could say to families is it's super helpful if the parents, the, you know, the, the older generation is still alive because they are kind of the velvet hammer that keeps everybody in line. Yeah. Once mom and dad die, it's like trying to herd cats. It's, you know, as you know, yeah. the cohesiveness is gone. So A, try to take advantage of it while the parents are still there. And B, it's really helpful to help the family members understand what this is about, what they're risking, what they're subject to with them and also their children in context with the wealth and what's fulfillment and purpose and all those things in their lives if they don't take action. And if they refuse to do those things, sometimes you can't help everybody. Oh, uh, yeah. We work with the willing. You help the people who are willing to be helped. Yeah. That's, that's all, all you can, can do. do. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> that's, yeah, unfortunately. Uh, that's how life works. I got one more question that came in. What age can I start teaching this to my children? Uh, four years old, you know, the dinner table. You have the dinner table conversations. They listen. Philanthropy is a great way to do it with young people. And, you know, talking about work and purpose and how it, you know, just imagine the father and mother sitting there and talking about how much value they get they, and appreciation they get out of their work or the people they've been helping and having that just be part of the dinner table conversation. They're, those kids are absorbing it all. And yeah. it's super powerful. So there, I don't think there's really a too young of an age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Honestly. I would agree with you. Kids pick up so much more than we are aware of. Not just like remembering, but they are aware of things that we kind of tune out. We just, we're yep. busy. We've got head down. We're working. <laughs> but they, yep. they have a lot of awareness. Yep. Uh, so they pick up on that stuff. Okay. Yeah. So that, now, sure. Richard, as I said in my introduction of you, you are an author. You have a book. And you mm -hmm. are going to make that available to our listeners. I want you to just talk a little bit about your book. Okay. So the book is Endless Inheritance. And it's really a book that can explain the problems that I, we've talked about, you know, the last half an hour, what the issues our families face, what happens if they don't fix them. There's a lot of stories in there, you know, stories of people that we've dealt with, because stories are very powerful of people that have really suffered really badly and other people who have done really, you know, good things with it. And there's exercises in there. So it's basically a do-it-yourself book. So if you really want to get involved in this, in your own family, you've got lots of things, there's, you know, there's exercises and experiences. We tell you how to run your family meetings and what things to look out for and how to prepare the whole thing. You can, you can just take it as a DIY book for people that want to do it themselves. Okay. All right. Yeah. And so if you're listening and you are interested in receiving a copy of that book, you can contact us at Absolute Trust Council. You can email us info at absolutetrustcouncil.com. You can call us on the phone and we will get you one of Richard's books. It's fantastic. It really is, uh, you know, this conversation times 300. It's chock full of Thank you. lots of good advice and, and examples. So I encourage you to do that. Okay, Richard, Thank you so much for joining us. I enjoyed this half hour so much. I learned so much and I really, really appreciate you. I know you're busy and thank you for your time. Thank you, Kirsten. It's been a blast. I really appreciate it. Good. Okay. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Okay. And thank you all for being here today. I hope you enjoyed the show and I hope you learned something that is useful to you. If you like our podcast, be sure to go onto iTunes and subscribe. To find our podcast, you just go on the podcast app and type in Absolute Trust Talk, or you can type in my name, Kirsten Howe, in the search bar and our podcast will appear and you'll be able to subscribe there. That helps us with visibility online, with SEO, all those kinds of things that I don't really understand, but they tell me it's good. So it helps us. <laughs> 
And besides searching for us on iTunes, you can also find all of our previous episodes on our website, AbsoluteTrustCouncil.com. We have lots of other resources there. Just click on the podcast tab on our homepage and you'll see all of our past episodes. And also make sure to catch our next episode, which will be out in a couple of weeks. I hope you'll get a lot out of that one too. And I look forward to connecting with you next time. Thank you so much for listening today. I really appreciate you being here. I am so grateful that you're in my audience and I hope you also learned something and enjoyed the show. If you like our podcast, be sure to go to iTunes and subscribe. You just type the words Absolute Trust Talk in the search bar on your podcast button on your phone and our podcast will come up and you'll be able to subscribe there. That subscription helps us with our visibility online, our SEO and all those kinds of things that I never understand, but I'm told that it's important. So in addition to searching for us on iTunes on your phone, you can also just go to our website and you'll find our podcast there. You'll also find all of our previous episodes. So you go to absolutetrustcouncil.com, click on the podcast tab on our homepage, and you'll see all the topic for all of our previous guests. And you just click on the one you want to listen to. Also, make sure to catch our next episode, which will be out in a month or so after this one. And I know you'll get a lot out of that one too. So I look forward to connecting with you next time. Thank you for listening to Absolute Trust Talk. If you loved this episode, head on over to iTunes to subscribe and leave us a review. Don't forget to visit our website, AbsoluteTrustCouncil.com, where you can find a host of guidebooks and other tools to help you through the estate planning and estate administration process. If you need help securing your own legacy, then put your absolute trust in us. Give us a call at 925-943-2740 or email us at info at absolutetrustcouncil.com to set up your free consultation today. This podcast is not meant to take place of legal advice from an attorney and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you do have a legal question or issue, please consult with an attorney.